In a world of globalization, economic uncertainty, terrorism, culture clash, family disintegration, corporate distrust, youth disillusionment, political confusion, and religious corruption, the wisdom to navigate successfully through life is necessary. Welcome to Living Effectively. Living Effectively, a program designed to provide wisdom, insight, information, and inspiration to effectively face the challenges of the 21st century world. And now, here's your host, Dr. Miles Monroe. Buy the CDs and the DVDs of all the sessions that you are listening to in this segment. Our theme this year is Kingdom Citizenship Authority. That's our theme for this year. So we'll be focusing on the authority of God in all areas of life and how to submit to that authority. And in this interim of teaching, we are looking at from the beginning of February where we talked about the love series looking at the authority of the kingdom citizen in relationships and I want to focus today on this topic write this down kingdom citizenship laws of love and marriage the kingdom citizenship laws of love and marriage I want to focus today for a few minutes on the subject of Understanding the authority of love in relationships like marriage. Whether you are single or married or divorced, what you're about to learn is important to you. Because I am convinced that love is the most misunderstood concept on earth. And I want you to take notes today for the sake of yourself, but also for your children and your grandchildren. In our last session, which you probably have, or if you didn't get it, please get the CD, I ended talking about the fact that marriage is the most important decision every human would make in their life next to their decision to follow Christ. Marriage is a decision that's more important than buying a house. It's more important than buying your first car. It's important for you to understand marriage because you can buy an expensive house and have a horrible marriage. A lot of people have built beautiful houses but can't live in them because they spent more money on the house than they did on their relationship. Some people buy a brand new car, but they can't drive together to work anymore because they don't speak to each other, which means your car is not helping you. It's interesting to me that most people's cars last longer than their marriages. And the reason why that is is because when you go to get a license for your car, the government would force you to take a test, study a book, and go on driving lessons, and they will make sure that you are qualified to drive on their streets. So to get a license to drive a car can take months. But if you go to that same government to get a marriage license, they'll give it to you in 20 seconds. Once you qualify, they give you the license. Which means that they are more concerned about your car on their streets than they are about your life in their community. None of us goes on driving lessons for our marriages. We don't have a requirement by the government to read books to get married. So we know how to drive, but we don't know how to live with someone. And this is why it's tough for most people. Many of you in this room and the thousands watching us around the world, you are victims of a broken heart. 
Some of you have tried marriage and you're at the point now where you're thinking, I ain't going to try this no more. But it's amazing when you get a car that's wrecked, you still buy another one. Somehow, you don't mind getting another car because you know how to drive. But you ain't sure you won't get another mate because you ain't sure if you know how to drive that situation. And the difference between the two is knowledge. Write this down. Choosing a life's partner for marriage must not be taken without careful and prayerful consideration. You can't just jump into it. Why? Because nothing in scripture and nowhere in the Bible does God command us to be married. You don't have to be married to be happy. Marriage is a choice that you can make. It's not a requirement by God. We also mentioned in our last session that God never chooses your mate. And I'm so glad. Because God is too smart to choose your mate for you. God knows that if you had him choose your mate and it didn't work out, you could blame him. So God gives you the complete responsibility to choose a mate. But he does help you. He gives you a brain with five billion cells. He gives you the Holy Spirit to guide you. He gives you his word to regulate your decisions. He gave you pastors to give you good counsel. He gave you parents to give you sense. And he gave you his own anointing to discern spirits and yet with all of that equipment some of us ignore it and we still make our own decisions I want to say this then that love is not the foundation for marriage this statement will cause problems I know it will because we normally get married to someone because we say we are in love can I suggest to you please after being married for 32 years myself and a very, very happy marriage, not a bad day for 32 years, can I say to you that love does not make marriage work? Don't be fooled by that, whether it's a feeling that you say you have for someone or an endearment to someone, if someone tells you good things. Don't get married because you love someone. I love aircrafts, but I can't fly them. You can love something and not know how to do it. So it isn't love that's the problem. It's knowledge to function in that. Let's talk a little bit about love in this session. Love does not keep marriage together. And I believe every divorced person here will agree with that statement. If you are divorced today, that means you were once in love with the person. So you didn't lack love. There were some other things that came up in the relationship that were stronger and more powerful than the love. Whether it was infidelity, unfaithfulness, whether it was abuse, physical abuse, or emotional abuse, or mental abuse, or whether it is neglect, or irresponsibility in finances, something came up that became more powerful than the love you had for the person. Which means that love can't save you. This is tough, isn't it? Write this down, please. Successful marriage 
is a result of the application of knowledge, not the exchange of love. You can be in love, young man, all you want. It doesn't make the woman the right woman. You can express your passion to this man all you want, but that love you have for that man won't make him the right man for you. And we need to get this fast because you see, in the book of Proverbs, verse 4, chapter 4, verse 7, it says, wisdom is supreme, so get wisdom. And in all you're getting, don't get love. Get what? Understanding. You want to understand what it is to be a woman. What it is to be a man. How to live with a human. You want to understand the idiosyncrasies of a female and the uniqueness of a male. You want to understand communication skills. You want to understand how to manage emotions and how to handle anger. You want to understand the dynamics of disagreements. You want to understand how to handle unfaithfulness, broken trust. You want to understand, because if you don't understand those things, you're going to dump that marriage. Many marriages today could have been saved. I, I'm, I'm sure of it. But the individuals didn't have the equipment, the knowledge to use to fix the situation. No marriage is irreparable, believe me. But most people either don't know or they're just so tired, try it, they quit. And believe me, problems can make you tired. And this is why it's important for you to get understanding. I like what it says in the book of Habakkuk, Hosea rather, chapter 4. One of my favorite verses in the Bible. It says, my people are destroyed for what? A lack of knowledge. Now here's the part you always miss. It says, because you have what? Rejected knowledge. I will also reject you, says the Lord. God is saying that ignorance is a choice. Here's what's important here about this verse. You cannot reject something that was not available. I know, I know, hey, I'm human too. I know you sit there and get tired of me saying, go buy this book. And you sit there and you got hell at home but walk past the bookstore. Do you know that all your problems that you're facing now are probably solved in a book in your house you haven't read? We reject knowledge. Have you ever sat in a session like this and you hear this kind of teaching and your first thought is, boy, he should have been here. Ooh, they should have been here to hear this. What you're saying is, they missed it. They rejected opportunity to get knowledge. And God says, because you reject knowledge, I also got to reject you because I can't help you with what you don't know. And then he said something very important. He says, and you cannot be a priest before me. You see that there? The word priest means representative. God says, I don't want you to represent me if you are stupid. I don't want you to go to tell people you know me and you dumb. Stop saying praise the Lord and you can't handle your life. You haven't gotten the material to represent me and they're telling everybody you know me. He said, don't tell anybody about me, please, because you are messing up my reputation. And here's the worst part. It ends with this. And I must also reject your children. What God is saying is, write this down. Ignorance is generational. What you don't know is transferred to your kids. So if you can't stay married and get it right, you got to be careful because your kids may also be in danger of having the same problem that you have. Can you always remember this? Learn for your unborn children. Read a book for your unborn children. Go to a seminar for your unborn children because that's what it's about. The less you know, the less they can learn. The more you learn, the more you can teach them because when you have information, you can transfer it to your children.
God says, you need to get understanding and knowledge. Now, I want you to write this, this statement down. The most misunderstood elements of relationship is love. The most misunderstood element and ignorance that we have is love. We don't know about love. Ladies and gentlemen, I speak as a servant of the Lord today with a heavy heart because we are struggling. Many of us are are tired trying to trust people. And it's because we are unrealistic. We are ignorant about what love is. Let's quickly review what we talked about in the last session. There are four types of love in the Bible. One is called phileo, which means brotherly love. The second is called eros, which is erotic love or fleshly love or sexual love. And the third one is sterego, and this is friendship love between two friends. And then there's the number four, and that is agape. That is the divine kind of love that God gives you. That's the kind of love that is not normal. It's a very important kind of love. As a matter of fact, that's the kind of love that forgives a person who commits adultery on you. You cannot get back with a person who breaks trust with you with phileo. You can never make up with someone who breaks trust with you with eros. If your spouse committed adultery on you, you don't want to sleep with them anymore sexually. So the eros is even gone. You're afraid you'll probably get AIDS. Or you can't even imagine what they were with with the other person. And so your memory and your imagination does tricks on you. And you can't even imagine sleeping in the bed with them anymore. Eros can't help you. The only way to get back after that brokenness, you got to go down to number four. Agape. You got to get to the point where you have to do what God did. Even while we were yet sinners, he died for us. Now that's tough love. That's love that ignores all the rebellion. It ignores all of the cursing of God. God says, I still love you. And that agape is in the believer. It's not in the world. But because we don't understand it, it's tough to do it. Make a note of this, please. Only agape makes permanent relationships possible. Only agape. Every other relationship will be temporary. So you cannot really experience God's promise of marriage, which is permanent until dead do you part, without God's material, which is agape. Everything else will fail you. Let me put it another way, please. Write this down. I'm giving you some good stuff here today. Write this down. Love is not emotions. And this is a very dangerous thing because emotions are actually chemicals. Did you know that? When you feel for someone, that's an emotional chemical reaction. And the problem with chemicals is they change every five seconds in your body. The chemicals are never stable. In other words, When your eyes look at someone, your eyes interpret certain things and you have a pleasant experience when you look at that person's face or their lips or their hips or their breasts or that man's six pack. And your eyes have a sensation and it registers to your brain and you go, "Mm mmm, mmm. Now, the adrenaline then kicks in and your body begins to produce adrenaline. Oh, these are adrenaline enzymes and you become excited now the excitement you feel is adrenaline it's not love and you think i'm excited about this person no you are adrenaline about this person and we interpret that feeling as love no that's a chemical reaction and if you fall in love on adrenaline excitement which some people call infatuation. The problem is we're going to have you look at someone else again, a different person, and get the same experience. And then a third one. And then a fourth one. 
What you going to do with the first one you looked at? And that's why people commit adultery. That's why folks who are engaged to be married still break that engagement and go with someone else because they, they, they confuse adrenaline with love. Love is not an emotion. Secondly, love is a choice. You have to choose love and you must choose to love. Why? Because love is the response to understanding the value of another thing. When you value something, you put a certain amount of love on it or endearment on it. For example, if you bought a brand new car, 2012, and it costs 112,000 US dollars, I think you would want to clean that a few times. In other words, the more valuable the thing is to you, the more you want to treat it nicely. If you bought yourself a watch for $50,000, you would probably want to keep that watch in a different place than you keep the one you have now. Because the more value you put on something, the more you feel in debt to take care of it. So love is really a response to understanding value. That's why God loves you. God looks at you and he sees himself. The Bible says you are made in God's image. So when God sees you, he don't see what you think. He sees himself and God loves himself so much. He refused to let himself go to hell. There was a value he put on you. By the way, value is measured by what you're willing to spend for something. Write that down, please. Can I say it again? Value is what? Measured by what you are willing to spend for something. In other words, <laughs> uh, when you pay for something, that's the value you gave it. So the more you pay for something, the higher the value placed on it. So here's the question. What did God pay to get you? He paid his own image on the cross, which means that God placed himself value on you. You are worth God. That's how you measure value. And so if someone really, really claimed that they love you, they have a response to understanding your value, that is measured by what they are willing to give up for you. God loved you so much, he gave up himself. Can you meet someone who can do that? Someone who will give up all the men just for you, brother. This woman gave up all the men. All the men want her. But she decided, choice, that she can give herself to you only until she dies. Man, that's value. That's love. It's a choice. Because the men who still want her didn't leave the planet. That's important. They don't go away. And when she goes to work by herself, they will wink at her still. But she got to remember, I made a choice. This woman you claim you love, what did you cancel for her? Did you cancel her, your, your own mother for her? You have to. If your wife got to compete with your mother, then your wife is not the most valuable person on earth to you. And she feels that. She want to talk to you and your mother call you on the phone to see you. You got a choice. And my advice is go with your wife. Tell your mama, ask my wife for permission to see me. Just like that. You know why? The Bible never says that you're supposed to, to stay with your mother. It says leave your mother and father and cleave to your wife. You were born to leave your mother. I was born, you know, when, before I got married, it was Claire. I sat with my mom and dad and even my sisters who were here today. I told them, look, uh, you know, I get married. And it's amazing, you know, when you choose to marry somebody, your family don't always like them. But guess what? That's your choice, okay? Remember that. That's your choice. You, you, keep, you make that choice. 
And I made it very clear. I said, now look, my getting married to this person doesn't bring two families together. It creates a third family. I'm going to say it again because you missed this. It's very important. In the Bahamas, this is what's destroying us right now. We keep thinking that two people bring two families together. That is not right. Because it invites interference. And some of you are divorced today because of in-laws who became outlaws. Come on, clap. You know it's true. Be nice. Clap. Yeah, they will get involved in your business. So you got to remember, look, when you get married, this ain't no two families coming together. This is the creation of a third family that is completely separate. And if you want to enter that family, you need permission. No one should just drop in on you if you are married including your mother or your father. You don't just drop in. This is a private environment. You need permission to come in here. Call me before you come, because I might not want you to come. This is destroying marriages. I've seen people who drop in on people, walk right in the house, how are you doing? Walk in the kitchen, open the pot. In your kitchen, fight. Oh, fight time now. No, that's a private environment. Protect your sanctity of your home. There's some mothers who need Jesus. Stay out of your children's business. <laughs> I get touch this no more. <laughs> I see them knives coming out, okay. <laughs> Write this down quick. Love is a force generated by a decision. Love has no feelings, you know. Wow. If God responded to you the way he felt about what you did to him, you wouldn't be redeemed today. Now, this is important because, see, true love has no feelings. It's a choice. If you wait on feelings, remember now, feelings are chemical. And chemicals change every five seconds. So if, if I love you because I feel like I love you, you might lose your love in five minutes. You ever heard this? We fell out of love. We don't love each other anymore. What that means is the chemicals changed. <laughs> the way I used to feel when I look at you, you don't look that way no more, so I don't get to feel it no more. You bigger, fatter, heavier, you know, you change on me. After five children, you don't look the same. Some women are under so much pressure to try and keep their husband's eyes on them that the stress is causing the woman to get cancer. Just the stress. Because that man doesn't know what love is. He starts saying things like, why don't you look like Cheryl? You put on too much weight. You know, you, 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 not, you know, look at this picture 10 years ago. That ain't you. See? And they start putting pressure on you. That man need beaten by me. Bring him to me. I will whoop him. Because he forgot that his stomach is now bigger than his chest. And his head receded. And his breath smelled worse. Sometimes we forget that we change too. Say amen anyhow. Amen. Praise the Lord. Love is a choice. You choose to love. Make a note of this please. Very important. Love is an act of the will. That should be love. Love is what? An act of the will. Say it with me. Love is an act of the will. I beg you to please write that down. Because we keep thinking that love is some emotional concoction deep in the soul. Love is an act of the will. You can decide to love your enemy. If you don't believe me, ask Jesus. He said, love your enemy, he says. And he made it a command. You obey a man, command out of a will. 
Love those who hate you, he says. Love those who despitefully use you. Love those who persecute you. How can you do that? It has to be a decision. And that's the kind of love you need for marriage. Because the person you marriage will be an enemy twice a week. <laughs> Maybe twice a day. <laughs> People will do things in your life to hurt your expectations. But you got to decide. I still love you. If Jesus said to love your enemies, then the person you couldn't get along with, you decided not to love them. Write this down. Love is a debt you owe. Boy, that's tough. Let me read where that came from, all right? Because love is really a law. Laws have no feelings. What did I say? Laws have no feeling. Law is a, love is a law. Sometimes you feel like running the red light because you're late. But the law says stop. Your feelings got nothing to do with this law. Do you know that if you love your children, you will chasten them? Sometimes you feel for your son so you don't whip him. The Bible says he that doesn't chasten his son hates him. You can't get your feelings in the middle of discipline. If you love the person and they did wrong, you discipline them. It has to be a will. I love you so much, I feel like not spanking you, but I'm going to whoop you. Why? Because I love you so much, I don't want you to go this way. This is the wrong way to go. It's love. Look at them. That's your dream, eh? We dream, and that's, that's, that's what we're going to be like. But let me wake you up real quick. John, John chapter 13, verse 34. Everybody read together. Read. A new commandment I give to you. Love one another as I have loved you, so that you must love one another. By this will all men know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Look at Romans 13, verse 8. I want you to read this out loud together. Romans 13, verse 8. It says what? Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law of God. It's a debt. I owe you to love you. Most of the time when you owe people, you don't feel like paying them. You don't feel like paying them. Talk to me. <laughs> when the light bill comes, you don't feel like paying the light bill. <laughs> when it's time to pay the mortgage, you don't feel like paying the mortgage. You don't feel debt. But you choose based on your integrity to pay the bill. That's why you love people. You're obligated. Try and take feelings out of your marriage, please. I know this sounds crazy. It's good to feel good, you know, but make, just monitor that. Don't mix it up with love. Because it doesn't work. Let me show you how deep this is. Look at John 13, 34. Read. A new commandment I give unto you. What he says. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. John 15, 12. Read. My commandment is this love each other as I have loved you it keeps repeating it it's a law it's a law I command it you don't feel like this verse 13 greater love had no man than this than a man laying on his life for his friends oh man listen to the words John 15 17 read this is my command that you love one another John 14 15 he says if you love me you'll obey what I command you and that is to love one another he said, if you love me, you will love people who hate you. You will do good to those who abuse you, who despitefully use you. You will still decide, I love you. Love. Let's, let's talk about where does love come from. I'm talking about real love now, not agape. I mean, not a stereo and phileo and an eros. 
eros from the word erotic, which is all that sexual pornography stuff. That's erotic. That's, that's, that's eros. That's flesh love. Don't get mixed up with that. Don't ever consider sex love. They are never the same. If someone tells you they love you, and therefore you should let them sleep with you and have sex, that person does not love you. You can't equate that with love. Matter of fact, they call sex in this uh, society making love. Making it. Making it. That means it doesn't exist. We got to make it. Let's make love. What do you mean make love? That means you don't get it? That's exactly what they mean. And they make it for 45 seconds. Over. And then they don't want to talk to you anymore for weeks. It's not love. Why are you all quiet during this series? I don't know what's going on. Make a note of this. Galatians 5. It says the entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Galatians 5.22. It says, but the fruit of the spirit is what? Is love. Love is not a gift. It is a fruit of the spirit. There's no gift of love in the Bible. Either it is in you by God's grace or you ain't got it. Now, let me say something very interesting here. Uh, If you are born again, that means you have the Holy Spirit. Is that right? Okay. That means you get the love of God. Then why you got a divorce? Let me explain why. Because having the Holy Spirit is not equal to having knowledge. Let me give it another. let Let me try something. Thank you very much. Someone understood me over there. Okay. Let me give an example. You can, you can have a complete tool set and can't kind of fix your car. Did it, you understand? You bought a brand new tool set from Walmart. I mean, ain't open yet. And you have it for weeks. And your car breaks down and you can't use nothing in there. Even though you got it. Having the love of God is not the same as having the knowledge to fix stuff. That's why you need this teaching. You need to know, how do I use this equipment? Everybody in this room, everyone in this room who got a divorce, everyone, and those watching me by television, everyone who got a divorce still loved the person during the time when they were getting the divorce. They still loved them. Because you just can't dump the tool test, the tool chest. The problem was they couldn't live together. That's all. Because there was so much ignorance. There was so much misunderstanding of how to use the tool. It makes me weep. People people would abuse or hurt someone. And then they'd say, but I love you. I don't know why I did that. And what they're saying is, I still got the agape. I'm still full of the Holy Spirit. But I didn't know how to use the tools. That's why you need knowledge. Don't get married on love. Where does it come from? Look at First John chapter 7. Chapter 4 verse 7, sorry. It says, read it together. Together. Dear friends, let us what? Love one another, for love comes from God. That's number one. That word love there is agape, agape. Read on. Everyone who loves agape has been born from God and they know God. Whoever does not love agape does not know God because God is agape. He doesn't have it. That's why the Bible says something else about love. I love it. Read this out loud. It says, whoever does not love does not what? Even know God. He's talking about agape. Because God is love. Again, 1 John 4, read. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. This is the real love. It comes from God. 
First of all, you meet someone and they don't know God, but they look good. They smell good. They dress nice. They got a good job. They got powerful access to money. They got all the nice cards and the rides and the house. They got the, you know, the, the, the house behind the gate. And they, oh, glory. Yeah, 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 yeah. But they don't have God, it says. Now, listen to me, friends. Even those who got God got trouble. Ain't no hope for you. Because someone tells you, I'm saved, that ain't no qualification to marry them. All they tell you is, I got a tool set. Don't know how to use a Christ thing in it, but I got a tool set. That's what it means. I'm saved means I got a tool set. I got the stuff. Don't know how to use it. Now, don't get me wrong now. <laughs> if you can take a chance, take a chance with someone with a tool set. For heaven's sake, don't take a guy who ain't got nothing, just walking around, cool, no God. The verse says what? God is love, watch this, whoever lives in love lives in God and God lives in him. That means this person got to be intimately covered by God. And even that's not enough now, it's not enough, but at least they got the raw material to work with. Let me explain why it's not enough. Don't they look cozy? Okay, write this down. Because love is this. Here's what love is. Write it down. Everyone write it down. Love is a decision to commit to meet another person's needs for the rest of their lives without expectation. Now, that's a high order. That's love. What is love? Love is a decision to commit to meet the needs of another person for life without expectation. The whole thing is love. That's agape. Let me tell you something. If someone falls into filio with you, that's friendship love. That means that's mutual agreement. You treat me nice, I treat you nice. You stop treating me right, I stop coming with you. So that's not agape. I expect you to behave yourself, then I'll be with you. That's for Leo. Eros says, you give me some, I give you some. I give you money, you give me sex. No money, no sex. So we got this, that's not, we got expectations there, you see. So that's not love. Then you got sterigo. Sterigo is, uh, you know, we, we are friends as long as you don't hurt me. So there's expectation. But agape is this strange kind of love. It has no expectation. Write this down. Love is therefore caring for a person. Now, caring is defined as anticipating a, pers- anticipating a person's needs before they demand them and meeting them right now. Let me say it again. Caring is to anticipate a need and meet it right now. When you care about someone, you study what they need tomorrow and give it to them today. This is too deep. Let me try it again. When you care, to to care means you anticipate a need that may come into need next week and you meet it this week. In other words, caring means I outthink you. Oh, this is too much. The word care then means that I don't even let you ask for anything. That's caring. If someone cares for you, they spend all their lives figuring out what you need next. And give it to you now. Boy, would it be nice to be married to someone like that? People say they care for you. Check, see what they anticipated you needed. And see if you got it. The Bible says, cast all your cares upon the Lord. Why? For he cared for you. The word cared, there's a Hebrew word. It means to anticipate a need and meet it. It says, God anticipated your need and met it before you even asked. You know when God said, when you pray to him, watch God now. He said, pray to me for what you need. He said, pray. He said, now when you pray, remember, 
While you are speaking, I will say, here I am. And while you are even yet speaking, I'll say, here it is. In other words, even before you finish the sentence. Let me ask you a question. Did God die for you after you sinned? No, because that's not caring. When God created you, he anticipated the possibility that you might fall. So the Bible says Jesus Christ was slain before the foundation of the world, just in case you fell. Give God a hand for caring. You know, uh, the, the kingdom standard for marriage is interesting. The kingdom says, if I propose to you to marry you, as a woman, it says, I will pledge you my troth, we call it. So I, we call it engagement today. So I say, I'm going to marry you. Okay. That means I decided to commit to meet your needs for the rest of your life and expect nothing from you. And I am going to care for you for the rest of your life. Now, okay, so I say to you, I want to marry you. That means, marry means I want to commit to meet all your needs for the rest of your life. And I expect nothing from you in return. I care for you. So I go away and I buy a house before we got married. I make sure it has refrigerator and washing machine, a dryer, iron, electric stove. I even make sure it has a maid. Oh, I'm getting deep now. And there's a car in the garage with your name on the license plate. We ain't married yet, you know. Hmm? And I got a closet big as the house because I know you. I got a shoe rack that can handle 300. In other words, I, I anticipate. The Bible calls it a dowry. A dowry is caring. You go off and prepare a place. And then you come back and receive them unto yourself. Here you are. You won't get married. You ain't got no money. You broke. Barely hanging on to a job selling peanuts. And you won't marry a person. And you living with your mother. And you tell them, I want to care for you. <laughs> Leave them in their mother's house. You ain't ready to care yet. Boy, yeah, let me back off that. See? People tell me they love you. Always remember what love is. What is love? Read out loud. What is love? Come on, out loud. Read out loud. I want you to get it in your brain. What is love? The decision to commit and meet my needs for the rest of my life and expect nothing. That's love. So the next time some guy or woman says to you, I love you, ask them, so that means you are going to meet my needs for the rest of my life and expect nothing from me? That relationship over. <laughs> but that's what they are asking for. Christ didn't just save us, he keeps us. Yeah, yeah, that's it. He supplies all of our needs according to his, you, you got to have something if you're going to take him out of the house. You got to have something, brother, brother. You got to have something to care. Some people are better off just Staying single a little longer. Because the person you're going with, mm -mm. you too expensive. <laughs> clap, 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 clap. You, they, they don't understand. The, the, the level of your demand is so high, you're going to get frustrated the first week. And I know all you women know what it is to marry a stingy man. Oh, Lord, to marry a stingy man. He won't know where every penny gone. You got to beg to buy a pair of shoes for three weeks. 
<laughs> I think I better quit for the bird dog. <laughs> but that's what love is. I told you we don't understand love. Love is a high order. So you take notes good and you have your conversations over coffee. If they want to take you for ice cream, take your notebook. Say, yeah, let's talk about ice cream and let's talk about this. You interested in me? Let me find out if you understand what we're getting into here. Because I don't want you, you know, I got a good life right now. I mean, a little lonely, you know, but I got a good life right now. So I don't want you to mess up my loneliness. You gonna exchange your singleness for frustration? Mm mm, baby. No, baby. I'm talking about the men too, you know. Some men doing fine. Then they marry a woman who's a parasite. She don't bring nothing to the relationship. Suck the lifeblood out of this guy. He lose everything. <laughs> Should I stop now, Doc? <laughs> All right, let me, let me finish it. Write this down. Love is the manifestation of inherent nature of God. That's why God is love. And God cares all the time. It's when God's agape flow through the human spirit, that's true love. And let me define agape for you in a practical way. You ready? You got to write this down. This is how agape is defined in a practical way. Don't ever forget this. Teach it to your children. And everyone get a copy of this CD, please, and DVD. Because this is one of the most important sessions you ever had. Young people, listen to this ten times before you wink at anyone. Because you don't want to take a chance with your life. There are many people in here who are hurting right now. Going through this sense, they're hurting. They're saying, my God, if I had had this 25 years ago. Or 30. <laughs> okay, here's what agape is. True love has no reason. What did I say? True love has no reason. This is what love is about. True love has no reason. In other words, if you could find a reason why you love someone, you just canceled the love. I'm going to say it again. If you can tell a person why you love them, the love is canceled. It's no longer love. This is why nowhere in the Bible, nowhere on any page does God ever tell us why he loves us. It doesn't exist in the Bible. Because the minute you give a reason, it's no longer love. Hmm. You know, I'm going to get in trouble, boy. But the next time someone tells you they love you, ask them why. And wait for the answer. Because the answer will be the destruction of the relationship. I guarantee it. Whatever they answer will destroy the relationship. You don't believe me? Let's prove it. First of all, if there is a reason, it becomes a condition. I love you because you got a good job, but you better keep that job, brother. That's the condition, you see. I love you because you weigh 132 pounds, 36, 28, 42. Listen, you better stay that size all your life. It's a condition. I love you because you're an athlete. you winning all the awards. Yeah, don't you ever get in an accident and get crippled from the neck down. Because the love is canceled. Wherever there is a reason, there's a condition. All right? Step number two. Wherever there's a condition... It gets worse. There's expectation. I love you because you got long hair. Well, listen to me. You better not cut that hair. I expect you to keep your hair the way I like it. So the pressure is on. And when you start growing old and it turn gray and start falling out, 
I don't want to see you anymore because it was the here that got me with you. It's a condition. Any condition becomes an expectation. It gets worse. The expectation will guarantee disappointment because nothing in life remains the same. You love a person because they, you know, are athletic or they got, you know, the Coke bottle shape. Listen to me, brother. After three babies and putting up with you, she can't keep no Coke bottle. What you going to do now? She look like her mother now. And that's why men go running around looking for these young women. They never loved you in the first place. They love your shape. It was the condition of your shape. So they go looking for it again around the high schools. It's not love. It was a condition. She loved you because you got that job, CEO at that company. And that company shuts down because the headquarters is overseas and now you are down to zero, brother. I wonder if she still will live with you. Condition. She expects you to live and work there for the rest of your life. It gets worse. Expectation and disappointments will lead to divisions in a relationship. Have you ever heard this? I didn't expect it to come to this. What they're saying is there's a division in my expectation. You let me down. And the division results in the worst thing in the world. Divorce. By the way, the word division, look at it very carefully. DI means two. Vision means one. So when you have disappointment, you end up with two visions in the house. And Jesus said, any house division against itself cannot stand. Once you change and get two visions, it's over in the relationship. This is why love has no expectation. If I expect you to always make $100,000 a year, you're in trouble. You better never lose that job. And the company in England never better close down in the Bahamas. I'll kill them. But you can't control that. There are so many people in this place who are pressured because of expectations. I see women in the morning, 5 a.m., jogging. <laughs> Why? Some dumb husband sitting over with a big belly saying, you, girl, you need to look right. And she's under pressure. Expectation. <laughs> Who do you think you are? You look ugly too. You get up and go jog, you fat belly. <laughs> but we, we got this unrealistic expectation. And here's the worst part. Divorce, divorce leads to death. Now, let me, what do you mean by death? Divorce is a death. Ask anyone who's been divorced in this room. It's a death. Something died. And it's all because of number one. You tell me why you love me and I am in trouble. Because now I got to maintain what you expect. It's too much pressure. So God simply says, I so love you. That's it. No reason. Never gives it. I so love you. I gave myself for you. That's why our relationships ain't working. Some of y'all think, you know, Pastor Miles is crazy, you know. Years ago, I told you, when I first got married, 32 years ago, in BFM, I told you, I said, look, I expect nothing from my wife, Ruth Ann, nothing. And today, she'll tell you, I expect nothing. She ironed my shirt yesterday. I told her, what you doing? We in the room, she ironed my shirt. I said, honey, I'd have done wake up ready to iron that. Why? Because I don't expect you to iron it. So I tell her, thanks. Every time she cooks, I tell her thanks. Why? I ready, when I come, I'm ready to cook. 
When you expect nothing, you prepare to do it yourself. And when someone does it, you appreciate it. This is real. You walk in the house, where my food woman? What you talking about? You just destroyed the relationship. She been working all day too. What's your problem? She just got on five o'clock. What's wrong with you? Put pressure on these people, man. Listen, if you love someone, you anticipate the need. Why don't you bring food home already cooked for her? Why don't you buy something for her? Anticipate she tired too. Lord, have mercy, help me, Jesus. Why don't you go home early and let her meet you cooking already? Blow her mind. Say, I anticipated you'd be tired, baby. And I cook filet mignon with baked potatoes, with some asparagus on the side, with cheese on the top, baby. I knew you'd be hungry. That's love. Walk in there, where my food? What do you mean, where your food? <laughs> I wake up, get out of the bed, I make the bed. My wife said, what you doing? I said, I slept in this bed. She said, you don't got to do that. I said, I know, but I expect to do it. I don't expect you to do this. That's why we are so close. That's why we love each other so much. Because there's no reason for our love. You got to get rid of it. Conditions destroy. I don't know why I love you. Let me give you a final thought here. Next, if we can pick up here. Number eight. The depth of a marriage goes deeper. It creates dysfunctional families. Kids without two parents in the same house. So the kids grow up now with a defect. And usually a divorced parent will breed a divorced child who also gets a divorce. In other words, number one, destroys society. And that's how deep that is. When you find reason for your love, you are destroying the Bahamas. Because you are creating criminals, potential broken homes, broken hearts, just by the decision to have a reason for loving a person. It goes all the way to the social decay in a country. Selah. We don't understand love. It ain't kissing and hugging and touching nobody's body parts. Love is so deep. We are still in eros. We need to go to the kingdom level. And number 10. Social decay results in community destruction. You want to destroy a community? Find a reason for your love. So your relationship is personal, but it's never private. It affects all of us. All of us. Some of you in this room, your parents got a divorce and you were 14 or maybe 12, and you are still trying to recover mentally. You live in between two houses. You make an appointment to see your parent. I mean, this, this is not easy. There's psychological issues going on here that people don't understand. I was talking to a young lady the other day up in New Jersey. She said, Pastor Miles, I just want to see my daddy. I just want to see him. I understood what she was saying. She said, he lives in California on the West Coast. I just want to see him. I'm at the age of my life now where I need to hear Father talk to me, she said. I got some decisions to make and I need a daddy. I just, hold, I just held her. She was 22. Social dysfunction. Look, I know there are many conditions in this room, but I'm dealing with the hope part. 
Let the future be better than the present. You are not married. Learn this lesson today. If you have been married and you plan to get married again, learn this lesson today. Go into relationships with sobriety. Ask God to give you wisdom and make decisions even though they may be hard decisions. Break off some relationship that ain't, you know it ain't right. Break it off now because you're on your way to destruction. Some of you got some friends you involved with right now talking about you plan to get married. You better take this session to them and say, let me check you out closely. Because my life is too important to walk around with a broken heart the rest of my life. And bring them next week. Bring all of them who you know to the session next week. Collect them up. Tell them, come. We need sense. Let's go get some sense. Because we are destroying our country. Because we don't understand love. You love this man. Don't put no condition on him. He may get fired in the morning or get laid off. And he comes home with a pink slip. Man, what you going to do? And he tells you, we got to move back in an apartment. We got to give him this house. Do you still love him? Or do you attack him? You're a failure. I should have never married in the first place. Woman, you need mm -hmm. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> you, we, we, your expectations create the problem. love you if you got nothing. I love you if you got something. What love is this? That's the love that works. Let that love be shared abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. Let me close with a verse. Read out loud, please. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. You come down that aisle in your white dress and you stand there with your tuxedo and your black suit and you stand before God and you start opening your mouth. Here's what God says. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it because God has no pleasure in fools. He called you a foolish person. If you stand there saying, I love you, tell dead do I part and you don't know what you're talking about. You make a vow, he says, and you don't fulfill it. I have no pleasure in fools. So fulfill your vow, he says. It is better not to vow, verse 5, than to make a vow and not fulfill it. Do not let your mouth, it says, do what? Lead you into sin. Don't rush to no altar. By the way, the most important statement in that verse is God. Is God. You never make vows to people. You make promises to people. Yes. Vows are only made to God. What you're telling God is, if I don't keep this, you can judge me. Oh. It's different from a promise. You can break a promise. But you can't break a vow. Because a vow attracts judgment. He says, do not protest to the temple messenger and say, my vow was a mistake. You ever heard that? I made a mistake marrying you. God said, you should never come to this house and say that in front of me. These are verses you never saw. I made a mistake. Why should God be so angry at what you say and destroy the work of your hands? Much dreaming and many words are meaningless. He said, you're dreaming, man. I love you. I'll, and in sickness and in health. What is this again? Poverty and wealth. Richer for poorer. Yeah, boy, we don't mean that. Many words. You broke, I gone. Rich is good, poorer, I gone. We, 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 we make vows. 
God says, what are you doing? You're giving this to me. You know, these words you put in my hands, you're giving me the power to judge you. This ain't to no preacher. This is to me. Slow down. Take your time. Look at the last part. He says, therefore, stand in awe of God. That means don't rush to no church with no bride dress. Don't buy no tuxedo too fast and get five men to stand with you with bow tie. Slow down. He says here, stand and be in fear of God. Be afraid to come down that aisle. Our problem is we ain't afraid no more. Well, if it doesn't work, I guess I'll get another one. Let me go down here and try this one. And you keep changing people. And both parties do it. Everyone doing it. It's, it's like people think this is a game. God says, look, be afraid of me because I will judge you. May God have mercy on us. I want you to just write this down. Promises are made to humans and can be broken. I love you. You're the only one I love. That's a promise. Don't trust that. They need to say that to God. Then they're under judgment. Promises have no consequences. Vows have consequences. That is why when you make a vow before the altar, have you noticed? Here's what you say. I promise to love you, to care for you, in sickness and in health, in riches and poverty. Watch this. Until death. The death is the judgment. You're telling God, if I don't keep this, you could kill me. It has an inherent judgment in it. Promises don't. An engagement is a promise. A marriage, a wedding is a vow. You can break off an engagement without, without consequences before God. But you can't break off a vow. God will judge you. There are folks in this room who are who, who've experienced they've been under judgment, they, they know what it feels like. They break that vow. They, they suffer some things, some death in their spirit, death in their emotions. They hurt so deep no one could explain the hurt. That's judgment. So if you're married, Paul says stay married. Fight for it. Try your best to put it back together. You don't want the judgment on you. If you've been divorced, thank God for this session. Go buy the CD, listen to it 10 times, and if anybody wink at you, tell them, listen to this too. It's 14 times. Because I ain't going twice in the wrong direction. So the first time, shame on me. Second time, shame on you. No, first time, shame on you. That's it. Second time, shame on me because I get fooled twice. You don't fool me twice. This one got to work, man. You got sense now. You know what to do. Let your children see you recovered and you know how to do it. I want all of you who are married to stand up, please. Those of you watching this program, wherever you are, if you're married, please stand up. If your spouse is not here, still stand. This is a very solemn session, isn't it? It wakes you up, doesn't it? It makes you realize how smart you was. Or is it the other way around? Tell your neighbor, there's room for knowledge. Now, if your spouse is standing next to you, put your arm around your spouse. Come on, hug him a little bit. Tell him, honey, I don't know why I love you anymore. Say it again. Say it loud, man. I can't hear you all. You're all trying to get mushy, mushy on me. I want you to say it loud under God's anointing. Tell them, I don't know why I love you anymore. Now tell them, I don't ever want to know again. Yeah, you want to kill that thing, see? You want to destroy the reason. Because where there's no reason, there's no condition. All the married couples in this room, 
God really loves you. Because God, God have you here today in this session. He must be really love you. He wants you to have success. He wants you to make this a testimony of the kingdom nature on earth. Your spouse is not the most perfect person in the world. Boy, do you know that. You know all their problems and secrets and all their defects. Matter of fact, you remind them of them often. But guess what? That's yours. That's what you chose. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, I can't believe I chose you, but anyhow. <laughs> this is a choice. Say it, I chose you. Say it loud. If your spouse ain't here, I want you to go home and tell them to their face, I chose to marry you and you ain't going nowhere. You can never get rid of me. I chose to marry you because we need to get to agape. God will give us grace. He's going to help us. I want those who are who have been divorced, stand up please. All those have been through divorce. God told me to pray for you all too. Thank you for joining us today on Living Effectively. For copies of this program, the complete teaching series, books, CDs, DVDs, magazines, and other resource materials by Dr. Miles Monroe, or information on seminars, conferences, workshops, and itinerary travels to your area, visit our website at milesmonroeinternational.com or bfmmm.com. Email us at info at mmi.com. And remember, our mission is to help you live effectively.